Hello, how are you all doing? My name is Ed Hope, a junior doctor working in the emergency department in the UK. And on this channel, we like to break down the medical science and injuries from TV and film. So what better show than the most popular Netflix show ever? It's Squid Game. Let me see. Let me see. First up, a traumatic epistaxis on Gi Young. As we're told, lots of capillaries in the nose as its job is to warm and moisten the air we breathe. Nosebleeds are so easy to get, huh? Because there are so many capillaries up there. And then this weird interaction. Poor thing. Ah, got a sweet taste to it. Your blood is never gonna taste sweet. Even high blood sugars seen in people with diabetes would only amount to a teaspoon of sugar in a litre of fluid. But that might be what the guy is trying to insinuate here. As we learn later, his mother has diabetes and it has a strong family link. So the dude is maybe trying to make him feel fragile about his health or maybe he's just being weird to psych him out. We've probably all tasted our blood when we've had cuts or we've lost teeth as a kid and we know that it tastes metallic and that's because of the iron core in the centre of the haemoglobin molecule. And lastly, tasting someone's blood, yeah. <laughs> Not recommended, but you'd have to be pretty unlucky to catch anything. Blood is sterile, but you never know. Someone could have a bloodborne virus, something like hep C or HIV. And if that got into your bloodstream via breaks in the lining of your mouth, you could get infected that way. I guess everyone's pretty tired. Next thing to take a peek at is the sedating gas used when escorting them to the island. Now, you see this type of thing in TV and film a lot, almost as much as the poison dart that shoots you in the neck and makes you go to sleep instantly. You're crazy, you're crazy. And there's a similar issue with both of these things. Sure, we have inhalation anesthetics that we use in the hospital to knock you out, but it always happens on screen way too quickly. So even with high flow concentrations with a mask, it's gonna take 30 seconds to a couple of minutes to knock you out. But the real issue is, once you are sedated, who is monitoring your airway, your breathing, <laughs> your vital signs so you don't die? In hospital, you'd have a highly trained anaesthetist right by you. A tragic real life example of the complicated nature of this is the Moscow Theatre hostage crisis in 2002 where gas was pumped in to try and sedate 40 or so armed terrorists and then the gas accidentally killed over 100 of the hostages too. So in reality, you shouldn't be surprised on opening the doors of the vans when you're on the island if a large portion of these players don't wake up. I know that too. I'm just counting the numbers. My doctor said counting is good so I don't get dementia or anything. If the YouTube analytics is anything to go by, most of you watching are under 35 and the idea of having dementia just isn't in anyone's worries, but it is a concern for a lot of patients, you know, of this chap's age and younger too. And number one is sort of right here. I mean, it sounds logical that the more you work the brain, the less likely it is to stop working. But in terms of dementia, it's not quite that clear. Although there is actually some evidence to suggest this, but it's still an area we need a bit more information on. So, I mean, if we look at the official line from the Alzheimer's Society, so far, no studies have shown that brain training prevents dementia, but it can't be a bad thing to do as it may improve your general memory and thinking that may decline with age, but we just can't yet say that it helps to prevent dementia like number one's doctor is saying. And maybe one of the reasons is that dementia usually has a disease process associated with it. So Alzheimer's, we have deposits of proteins in the brain or vascular dementia where the blood supply to the brain is affected. On to the first game that is red light, green light. Or in my childhood, we played a variation called What's the Time, Mr. Wolf? You are allowed to move forward when it shouts out green light. Stop when it shouts red light. If your movement is detected afterwards, you will be eliminated. But the version we see here is even more brutal than getting into med school. Eliminated. 
the first guy to get shot, we don't see exactly where the entry wound is, but it's caused bleeding into the upper airway, enough to elicit his gag reflex and then bring up the blood. So to have a gag reflex, we know he's still alive at this point, which makes sense that he's only just been shot. So really there are two things that are likely to kill him from this point. First of all, that blood blocking his airway, stopping him from breathing. And secondly, the amount of blood he might potentially lose. So we can see some already being coughed up here. There might be more in the thoracic cavity. So over time, he might be heading into hemorrhagic shock. We then see multiple different gunshot wounds, mainly to the head and chest. Clearly, they're shooting to kill by targeting areas that have life critical organs. So to the head, we're gonna get a skull fracture, and then the bullet will go through the brain, ripping the tissue apart along its track with a concussive shearing force spreading to a wider area. That track will then collapse down and you'll start to get bleeding inside the brain. And then in the chest, we'd mainly worry about damage to the big blood vessels that come off the heart and lungs. You could also get a pneumothorax, so a punctured lung, or bleeding around the lung, so a hemopneumothorax, and the bullet may also rupture the ventricles of the heart. And if you survive the direct injury to these organs, you then have to stop the resulting bleeding. So although a lot of these injuries, patients will be killed instantly, some will still be alive, but unconscious, never to wake up again, but some will be survivable, particularly because it's a single bullet and people get lucky the bullet may miss key structures. For example, the mortality from gunshot wounds to the chest in general ranges from 15 to 50%, but if the heart is involved, it's closer to 80% will die. Given the numbers here, so around 250 people shot, so if we go very conservatively, say 10% of the injuries are survivable, that's 25 people that should be okay. But, we have the added complication of the scene here. The fact there are so many casualties will limit the chances of those who could have potentially made it. Also, not being funny, I don't think many of them are gonna get great medical care under the squid gang. And we actually see the fact that some people survive depicted by people struggling and being shot again, and even people regaining consciousness later within the coffins. I don't know if those people are lucky or unlucky. She's diabetic. She left it untreated and it got worse. Guillaume's mum is in hospital for a foot infection, a complication of her diabetes. One good thing is the hospital doesn't look that busy. That's <laughs> always an unusual sight and I commend them for picking an illness and a complication that is extremely common that we see every day in hospital. Diabetes is really a disease of the circulation as long-term high blood sugar levels damage your blood vessels. And this really is a two-pronged attack on your feet. You get poor circulation down there, what we call peripheral vascular disease, but you also get damage to the tiny blood supply to your nerves, what we call peripheral neuropathy. With this nerve damage, you get reduced sensation to your feet, so you don't know they're injured. So if you step on a pin or you're sitting uncomfortably, you can't feel it, so you don't do anything about it. This damage to the feet can lead to ulcers as well as infection of the soft tissue, what we call cellulitis. And this infection can travel deeper and can travel to the bone, what we call osteomyelitis, a much more serious problem. And with the poor blood supply, it's harder for your body to heal and harder for the treatment of IV antibiotics to get to the area. She had to be in a lot of pain recently. You didn't know? Will you be able to treat her for it? In the worst case, she might need to have her feet amputated. And yeah, ultimately amputation may be needed, otherwise the infection may spread locally or the patient may develop sepsis. Don't you remember? I told you, I've got no money. Business isn't going so well. Look and... at what working here did to my body, sir. I couldn't afford the hospital either. Trigger finger. So what we're looking at here is a tenosynovitis. So the muscles that control the flexion of your fingers, the bending of your fingers are in your forearm and connected to the bones of your fingers via tendons. And these tendons travel through little lubricated tunnels called tendon sheaths. So if you imagine we have inflammation and swelling around these protective sheaths, it stops the tendon 
from freely passing through it. And in its extreme can prevent the tendon moving altogether, meaning the finger gets stuck in this position. And usually it's associated with medical problems such as diabetes, but as they point out, you can also get it from strenuous use of the hand. Give me my money. Any type of crush injury is not good. Losing the framework of your bones and your soft tissue architecture, along with damage to the blood supply, it means it's very difficult for your body to heal properly. So injuries like this require multiple bespoke surgeries to conserve whatever function they can because your hands are super important. And with a mechanism like we see here with this industrial machine, we're likely to not only get a crush, we'd also expect an element of degloving too. So the skin and soft tissue being stripped off the deeper tissues like a glove coming off the hand. Yes. <laughs> As much as the whole show has its shocking moments, this one is particularly brutal. So penetrating trauma to the right anterior lateral thigh and a huge amount of blood spurts out. Given the amount of blood, I'm guessing this has gone deeper and kind of round the back as well and ruptured the femoral artery or vein. <laughs> It's of little consequence because we then see multiple stab wounds to the back, firstly in the region of the right renal angle, so possible kidney injury and damage to the inferior vena cava, and then several more stab wounds to the chest, and you'd get similar injuries to what we talked about earlier with the gunshot wounds, so hemoneumothorax, bronchial rupture, cardiac rupture, and damage to the great vessels. And then <clears throat> this scene from episode three. Now, there are many things that are designed to go inside you for various reasons, and everything else on the planet is not. And the shape of this is potentially a problem because it may be difficult to get a grip on it and to remove it. Trust me, <laughs> I've seen this stuff before. I've had to remove stuff like this before. Look, if things get stuck up there, someone has to take them out. So we're happy to do that, but the trick is not to get things up there in the first place. So there you have it, my breakdown of the medical science and injuries of the first few episodes. Probably by the time you've watched this, I've seen the whole of the first season. So let me know what you think and if there are any other medical scenes or other things you want me to break down. And as always, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to check out Squid Game with me. Like and subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you soon. You shouldn't be surprised on opening. Who's this? Who's this? Who's this? I've never sat up here before, and as soon as I film... You want the limelight, don't you? <laughs>